the topic of catalysis. So, so far in this chemical kinetics live streams series, we've talked about a few ways by which the rate of a chemical reaction can be controlled. Usually we like to increase reaction rates, right? Because chemists, you know, we, we don't have all day. We want the reaction to proceed as fast as possible. So we talked about how the rate of a chemical reaction can be increased uh, by manipulating concentration, right? Assuming it's not a zero order reaction, most reactions are not zero order. They do, the rates of the reactions mostly do depend on concentration, uh, but we're limited, right? There's a limit to how concentrated we can make a reaction mixture. We can't just infinitely concentrate uh, the reactants. So that's, uh, that's quite limited. Uh, and then there's temperature, right? We, uh, when we talked about the Arrhenius equation, we understood that increasing the temperature increases the reaction rate because it increases the rate constant. And there's also limits to how hot you can get the reaction mixture to, because if you get it too hot, well, then you might start getting some undesired reactions. Uh, the molecules that you want to keep intact might start breaking apart, and that's no good. So there's a third way by which we can increase the rate of the reaction, and that is by using what's called a catalyst. So you've probably heard the term catalyst before, you know, like let's say... Um, yeah, I used to live in Orlando, so we could say uh, when when Dwight Howard was uh, was drafted by the Orlando Magic, he was the catalyst that they needed to get to the Eastern Conference Finals, right? <laughs> Something like that. So there's a lot of colloquial usage of the term catalyst, but catalyst has a very, very real and very, very literal definition, and that's what we're going to talk about in today's lesson. So a catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed by the reaction. A substance that increases a reaction rate without being consumed by the reaction. So to explain how this works, let's consider a particular chemical reaction. So the example that we're going to look at in this one is the non-catalytic destruction of ozone, whose chemical equation is shown right here. So ozone uh, O3 is a component of the upper atmosphere, right? And it gets destroyed naturally according to this equation where you have, uh, and this is a one-step uh, mechanism where you have a molecule of O3 colliding with uh, um, an individual oxygen atom uh, to produce two O2 molecules. So it occurs via one elementary step. And you might think, oh, no, the ozone is being destroyed by this reaction. Well, yeah, it is, but it's occurring naturally. And this particular reaction is slow because it has a fairly high activation energy, right? Now, imagine that there's a catalyst introduced to this reaction, um, which happens a lot because of uh, man-made uh, chlorofluorocarbons, which I'm not trying to go on some environmental rant or anything like that, but this is just an example of of, uh, of one reaction uh, that's catalyzed by um, by man-made um, chlorofluorocarbons. So the destruction of ozone can actually be sped up uh, and catalyzed by chlorine. And the chlorine atoms, again, they come from chlorofluorocarbons. So the way that chlorine catalyzed destruct, uh, destruction of ozone works is by a two-step process, right? In the first step, you have a chlorine atom colliding with an ozone molecule to produce uh, ClO and an O2 molecule. And then in the second step, you have the ClO molecule that was produced by the first step colliding with an oxygen atom to yield one chlorine atom and one oxygen atom. So notice that so that the initial definition of, of catalyst was something that uh, increases the rate of a chemical reaction uh, without being consumed, right? So in this case, the chlorine, that's the catalyst, right? Now notice that the chlorine is introduced as a reactant in the first step, and it's a product of the second step, right? So it's regenerated by this mechanism. So it's not actually consumed. It's consumed for a, for a very short period of time in that first step, but it's reproduced in the second step. So, so this mechanism, uh, this chlorine catalyzed destruction of ozone occurs via two elementary steps rather than one. Uh, and each of those two steps have low activation energies. Now you might be thinking, how does adding a second step to a mechanism 
going to speed up a reaction. It's kind of counterintuitive. You would think adding a second step would actually slow things down, uh, but that's actually uh, not the case because remember, it's not about how many steps there are. It's about how fast your slowest step is, how fast your rate limiting step is. And so um, if we look at this, uh, just to, to show you, uh, for instance, um, if we cancel out the catalyst and we cancel out the CLO uh, intermediate, uh, notice that if we add these two reactions or these two elementary steps together, we do indeed get the same uh, reaction that we had before, right? The one that occurred in one step where you have O3 plus O yields to O2, right? So just wanted to make sure I put that in there that they're they're both the same reaction. They're just occurring by two different mechanisms, right? And so we, if we look at a diagram of this, this is another one of those energy versus reaction progress uh, diagrams. So the graph shown in blue here, this represents the uncatalyzed pathway, the single step mechanism that occurs naturally, right? And it has a high activation energy because this little hump right here is really, really high up, right? And notice that there's one of them. There's one of those uh, uh, peaks right here, right? Cause, cause there's, which makes sense because there's one step, right? Um, and in red, this represents the catalyzed pathway where we have uh, two steps, right? Two humps, two local maxima, right? So notice that we have, like I said, these two different pathways here, the uncatalyzed pathway uh, that has a very high activation energy for its rate limiting step, which is the only step, and the catalyzed pathway, which even though it occurs via two steps, each of those two steps uh, has a very low activation barrier. And so therefore the uh, catalyzed pathway is going to be the faster reaction. So in this case, um, the reaction that is being catalyzed is uh, an unfavorable one. It's one that we really don't want to happen because the ozone layer is important because it protects us from the damage of ultraviolet light. Uh, but other times, uh, oftentimes, we actually uh, intentionally use catalysts to speed up reactions that we do want to occur. We, we speed up reactions that we do want to go faster. So for instance, one of those such reactions is the catalytic converter in your automobile. So you've probably heard the term catalytic converter before, uh, but you may or may not have given much thought to what, it, what that term actually means or, or how it works. So the catalytic converter is a component of your vehicle that's connected to your exhaust, right? So your engine, it burns up some fuel and then the fuel turns into exhaust and that exits your, your vehicle, right? Now, in the engine of a car, um, there's combustion of the fuel, but the combustion is generally uh, not complete. There are, there are plenty of incomplete combustion products. It, it's not a completely efficient process, right? And so there's a couple of things that come out of the car that are really nasty, like carbon monoxide, like nitric oxide, like nitrogen dioxide, uh, fragments of the fuel that just didn't get burned, all of those kind of things that if they were released into the atmosphere, well, they're, they're not so good, right? They're not so good uh, for, for the environment, right? And so the way that the catalytic converter works is it has this, uh, this high surface area ceramic structure. And within that high surface area ceramic structure, let's try saying that 10 times fast, you have uh, these metal catalysts. You have platinum, palladium, rhodium, uh, little, little bits of that metal, right? And that metal catalyzes the reaction of these nasty materials that we don't want into the atmosphere to make things like water, which is harmless, right? I mean, we drink it, it makes up over half of our bodies by mass, right? Uh, nitrogen gas, nitrogen gas is very inert. It's pretty much harmless. It makes up 78% of the air that we breathe. So nitrogen is infinitely preferable than something like nitric oxide or nitrogen dioxide, which are both toxic, uh, and CO2. And, you know, obviously it's debatable about how good CO2 is for the atmosphere. Um, it is a greenhouse gas, although plants seem to like it. They, they consume CO2. Uh, but it, CO2 is definitely a lesser evil than just plain CO, right? CO2, carbon dioxide, much better to have in your atmosphere than carbon monoxide. So the catalytic converter uh, takes advantage of catalysis uh, to convert things that are bad to things that are either good or not as bad. So that's how your catalytic converter works. And there's another uh, sort of thing uh, with catalysis that I wanted to tell you guys about. Now, this is from, from personal experience. So 
at my last job, not the job where I'm working now, but uh, my last job, I did a lot of work <clears throat> with um, inert atmosphere chemistry, like a lot of, uh, I worked with a lot of air sensitive and moisture sensitive materials, like things that if you, you know, open the container in the presence of air, it would ignite or it would ruin the material. So pretty dangerous stuff. And one efficient way to handle these kinds of things is by using a glove box or an anaerobic chamber. And this is actually the kind uh, right here that I used to use every single day. <laughs> and um, as you can imagine, it can be pretty pretty difficult to reach with those gloves and, and try to do delicate work that way. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to bring to your attention is this thing right here. This thing, it's, it's called the heater or the, the blower, is, as, as it's often called. So the way that this works, right? So obviously you have this chamber and you wanna keep the oxygen out of it, right? Because oxygen is the component of the air that reacts with air sensitive materials, right? So you have this, this unit here and what, what it does is it takes the atmosphere that's inside the glove box and it sucks it through the bottom and it pushes it up through the top, right? And at the top, notice that there's this metal thing. This is a palladium canister. So it's this metal canister that has a bunch of little palladium pellets in it, right? And what that does is it catalyzes the reaction of hydrogen with oxygen to produce water. So whenever you are um, filling this chamber with gas, the gas that you fill it with is uh, part, part of it, most of it is argon, uh, but the rest of it is hydrogen. So you intentionally introduce hydrogen gas in here to react with any oxygen that leaks in uh, just incidentally, because no matter how hard you try, there's definitely going to be some oxygen that leaks in. So that oxygen reacts with the hydrogen that you already have in there, and it's catalyzed bit by this palladium canister in here, and it produces water. Now, it's also not good to have water in your glove box either, uh, but that's why there's this thing up here. This is called a drying train. It's basically like these three canisters. You push a button, and it cycles the atmosphere through the drying train, and it's, it's packed with uh, molecular sieves that trap the water. So it's pretty cool stuff. It's pretty cool stuff. It's a very um, elegant solution to the problem of air and moisture contamination within a uh, an inert atmosphere anaerobic glove box. So just another example of catalysis uh, doing work for us. Um, now, one thing I wanted to touch on is uh, two different types of catalysis, uh, which are homogeneous and heterogeneous. So uh, and these are pretty straightforward. Uh, a homogeneous catalyst is a catalyst that exists in the same phase as the reactants. And then on the flip side, you have heterogeneous cat catalysts, which exist in a phase that is different from the reactants, right? So an example of homogeneous catalyst, that would be like the chlorine that gets introduced into the atmosphere uh, that catalyzes the destruction of ozone, right? because the chlorine is a gas, the ozone is also a gas. They're the same phase, right? Heterogeneous catalyst, that would be like the solid bits of metal that are suspended in that ceramic structure in the catalytic converter of your automobile. So just as a little diagram here, we can see uh, these two different types of catalysts here. Uh, homogeneous catalyst, as I said before, uh, is the, uh, the same phase as your uh, reactant particles. Uh, in this case, they're both gases. And then in the... Uh, a heterogeneous catalyst, um, in this case, uh, we have like a solid catalyst, like with the palladium or rhodium or whatever, catalytic converter, um, different phase of matter as your uh, reactant particles. So <clears throat> the last thing uh, that I wanted to talk about, uh, just as I suspected, the stream is going pretty quickly. So um, are enzymes, which are uh, catalysts within organisms. So if you think about all the tools that chemists have available in the lab to speed up chemical reactions, like increasing temperatures really high, uh, increasing pressures, um, you know, increasing concentration, things like that, a lot of these techniques that we use in the laboratory are not available to biological organisms because, you know, high temperatures and high pressures and stuff like that would damage living cells. So we don't, we, they, they don't have those, organisms don't have those methods available, but what they do have are these things called enzymes. You've probably heard the term enzymes before, uh, but basically what an enzyme is, is it is a protein. Now, proteins are these biological molecules that are made up of very, very long chains of amino acids in a particular sequence that bend and fold and form all these uh, intricate, elaborate shapes. 
So an enzyme is a protein uh, that, act, <clears throat> that acts as a catalyst. So, and the way that it acts as a catalyst is the enzyme has a very specific, uh, specific region um, located in it, which is called the active site, which is shown here. And that active site is basically like a lock and the molecule that is going to undergo the reaction, which, is, which we call the substrate, is like a key. So the substrate fits into the active site of an enzyme similar to a key fitting into a lock, right? And because of the way that the enzyme binds the substrate, it binds the substrate in a way that uh, that allows for, let's say, an ideal uh, reaction where the activation energy is much, much lower, uh, and that substrate reacts to form products in a way that is much faster than if it were left to react on its own without the enzyme. Hey, hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to watch the full video from which this clip was taken, click the box over there on the left. And if you'd like to watch my entire chemical kinetics playlist, click the box on the right. Thank you very much for watching and take care.